Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this session bright and early at 9 a.m. Uh, if your coffee hasn't woken you up yet, I hope this rousing discussion on technical documentation will do the trick. Um, my uh, name is Andrew Berry, and this is my first Drupal DoveCon. It's actually been over a decade since I've been in the DC area, and I'm just really glad to be here. I loved uh, seeing everything flying in. And uh, today, I'm going to be talking about architecture decision records and uh, Lullabot's journey with them. Uh, first off, I want to give a call out to all the sponsors of this conference. I really feel like conferences like this are the, the lifeblood that keeps the Drupal community going. Uh, I think for many of us who have been in the Drupal community 5, 10, even 15 years, these are the things that bring us back together and keep us involved. And we couldn't do it without sponsors like these. So uh, thank you to all of those and the conference organizers and volunteers for putting this together. Uh, so for those of you who missed on the, the uh, program, my name's Andrew Berry. I'm the director of technology at Lullabot. And my background is in Drupal and PHP and server-side back-end software development. Uh, I live in Guelph, Ontario, which is about an hour west of Toronto, up in Canada. And uh, my other technical passion is home automation. And so if you hear that and you're like, oh, I wish Andrew was talking about Home Assistant or Zigbee to MQTT or how to consume radio data into your own dashboards and so on, come, come find me after and uh, we can talk about that instead. So, to start off, uh, I want to set the stage with this line from Michael Nygaard. And I really think this idea around quantifying and understanding the value of your documentation is really the core to creating good documentation. So as I go through sort of some table setting and explains where Lullabot was at in 2021, uh, I hope we can keep this in mind. Uh, so, in 2021, we had our company retreat. Uh, Lullabot is a completely distributed company. You know, as I mentioned, I live in Guelph, Ontario, but you know, people have lived wherever they want to live within the US, Canada, Spain, UK, more. Uh, and so we were all getting together in, it would have been late January in 2021, to think about our direction for the next year. And in our state of Lullabot presentation, uh, our CEO, Seth Brown, gave us these two words. He said we needed to stand, do a better job of standardizing our processes and we needed to simplify them so that we could do a better job of delivering quality work faster. But, you know, those are the words he gave us as a company. But what do they actually mean to each individual department or team? So we started to take those and do some brainstorming and think about what this could mean for engineering and software development at Lullabot. And to us, what we the, the direction we ended up going in was that this really meant about improving our knowledge transfer across project teams. We were hearing from our developers that they would change projects or change teams that they were on, and it was like working sometimes for a different company, at least as far as the technical direction of each project was. And as well, we knew we wanted to improve the onboarding experience for new developers, both to new projects and to Lullabot. Uh, when I joined Lullabot in 2010, you know, I was literally told, like, we're going to put you on a project and figure it out. And I personally, that works really well for me. You know, I, I loved as my first working day going to a client's uh, on-site or having a client meeting and like being facing, uh, customer facing and just starting to solve problems. But that's not everyone, and it's not fair to expect that every employee you have uh, at your company feels that that's the, the best way for them. And we also felt like we needed to focus on new unsolved problems, and we need to try and stop reinventing the wheel in different ways. And so when we thought of those as problem spaces to try to solve, uh, we started to take a look and evaluate our actual implementation on different projects, both from a business standpoint and from a, a technical standpoint. And while I did mention that it was challenging for developers to move between different projects, uh, at Lullabot, we fully dedicate our team members to a single project at a time. And so uh, when, you, you know, when I was working with the state of Iowa, for example, that was my only client for a year and a half, two years. Uh, and we do teams this way too. So there is obviously some changes over, the time, over time for longer projects, but uh, it does mean that often a project ends. You know, we're in the agency world, 
you have a point where you finish meeting that big team, you go more into a sort of support and maintenance phase, and it's not as heavy in terms of the development workload, uh, and that you have a team to sell. If you're in sales, it's really helpful to say, okay, well, we know we've got a project manager, two developers, a designer, and a PM available. Let's get them sold as a unit. We already know that they can succeed. But what that means is that best practices often end up becoming team-based instead of being based on either project needs or company goals. And so that means that you end up, we were siloing all of these best practices within our teams and not having a good opportunity to sort of cross-pollinate between them. What this also means is that uh, you end up coming up with different, but I'll say equivalent solutions to the same problems. Uh, and this is not really surprising when you think about that we are all coming from Drupal, we're coming from the open source community. How many paradigms are there in Drupal for laying out a page? You've got you know, just writing templates in Twig, you've got paragraphs, you've got layout builder, you've got proprietary solutions like Aqua Site Studio, DXPR, and so on. Uh, and soon we'll have Experience Builder. And I mean, Experience Builder will hopefully be the better solution when it's available, but I don't think anyone would agree that at 1.0, Experience Builder is going to solve every use case that all these other solutions have. Uh, and so we're used to having to evaluate different solutions that all get you to the 80%, but then really focusing on that last 20% of complexity. Uh, but from a business standpoint, that's kind of the opposite of standardize and simplify. That's you know, creating very bespoke solutions for every single project that you're on. So we wondered if maybe this was a problem if, if our efficiency losses were actually a communication issue. And so we started to look at how our teams communicate and where they communicate. So think about all the places where written communication happens on a team, not just uh, meetings that you have on Zoom or Meets or the phone if you're still using that. Um, you know, decisions that affect our projects get made, say, on Drupal.org. Uh, sometimes you will be looking at issues and change requests and actual code comments to understand why a technical decision was made in Drupal or a contributed module. Uh, anyone remember IRC? We got folks here who used to, yeah. So Freenode was a nonprofit that hosted IRC channels similar to Slack before Slack existed. Uh, and there was a lot of technical decision making that happened in Freenode. And originally, unless you were literally logged in, you would not see the messages about those decisions. And you would come across an issue on Drupal.org and it would say, as we talked about in IRC yesterday, and you'd just kind of be shrugging your shoulders. Now, eventually there was uh, a web archive, there were bots that were you know, creating indexes and so on of those questions. Um, but you know, there was a lot of decisions being made there. And of course, I'm sure many, if not all of us, have used tools like Jira, where you're recording decisions for your project. And uh, you know, those can uh, have a lot of context and information in them. Other teams might be using GitHub for pull requests or issues. Uh, oh yeah, and then Freenode went away. So uh, you know, there was a decline in its use uh, as Slack became more and more common. But then the actual nonprofit behind it just kind of fell apart and the person who, there's basically it was one person who was really keeping the lights on and things just, that was it. So, you know, even if they had had their own archive and hosting service, all that information is gone. Oh yeah, Confluence, I'm sure we've seen decisions made in Confluence and you're like, why is this in the middle of the wiki page, right? Like, how was I supposed to know this decision was here? Uh, and Slack, of course, today, though, in uh, Drupal.org's public Slack, decisions could get lost because we don't have a paid account. So I think after so many messages or so many days, Slack just deletes them. So if improving our team communication wouldn't let us standardize and simplify, that really only left us with one answer, which was documentation. But every team I've ever worked with has tried to solve problems with documentation, and most of them have some big challenge with it. So, you know, when you think about writing documentation, you need to think about the home of the documentation. You need to think about what 
underlying format it's written in, whether it's text files in a repository or a wiki instance or Confluence or something like that. You've got to think about who's going to write and maintain it. And most importantly, you have to know if it's going to be effective or not. And how do you evaluate documentation that was written two, three, four years ago and know that it's still valuable? So I'm going to give an example of an actual documentation ticket I had on a project a few years ago. And the title of the ticket was, Write Documentation for How We Fix Our Site If It's Dead. And in this case, it was a client where we were wrapping up the project and they were going to be hiring folks to help maintain their site. They had the funding to do that, but they hadn't hired them yet. And so there was going to be a gap of about three months where we weren't on the project at Lullabot and the only people, the people who were in charge of the website were non-technical project managers. Uh, and so they didn't have the expertise to know how to solve an outage like this, and they didn't have the team members internally they could rely on. And really, that, that was the root of the problem here, right? They were asking for documentation that even in the best case, probably they wouldn't have been able to execute on. And just think about all of the ways that a site can break. You could have hosting outages. You could have a deployment of a Drupal upgrade going bad. You could just have general internet issues. Maybe the site's not down. Maybe it's your home internet. Um, there could be new bugs that no one expected. You could have DDoS's, security issues. And they wanted documentation understandable by these non-technical PMs, <coughs> but they didn't have the expertise to approve or feel comfortable in saying, hey, this documentation is actually going to solve our problems. So yeah, this was a bad documentation request. It didn't have a good understanding of the skills or the background. It didn't have actionable su suggestions. The steps were not repeatable. And they wanted it written in a tool which was just, imagine SharePoint, but worse. Um, and you know, we ended up solving this by saying, hey, this is not the actual solution to your problem, right? Uh, you know, your, your solution should be accelerate your hiring and get support team members in place as soon as possible. So how could we avoid these pitfalls as we came back to this idea of standardizing and simplifying our processes? Um, and you know, when I think about it at Lullabot, there were documentation efforts in project management and site building and engineering going back to <coughs> 2010, 2015, and none of those stuck around. And I think it's because we didn't properly answer those questions about how the documentation was going to be used and who it was going to be used for. So, um, you know, like I said, this was 2021. And uh, I mean, I don't really remember 2021, but I do, but I kind of wish I didn't. I mean, you know, everything was locked down. Uh, in Ontario, we had amazing weather. We had so much snow, it was so good and the government ordered all public ski hills to be closed. So, you know, every time you're driving by on the highway, you just see this snow, it's just like, I can't be there. It was, it was painful. Um, and so, you know, I was stuck at home, and I was bored out of my mind, uh, and I figured, well, what can I do at home? Well, I can automate everything. Um, and, you know, I didn't want to have to install it the way they wanted you to, which was like with a Raspberry Pi and all that, because remember at the time, getting things like Raspberry Pis was also impossible. So I was looking for other ways to install and run it. And you know, I found this in the Home Assistant documentation. And OK, it says, hey, these are the operating systems we support. That's fine. Um, but the really important bit oh, here. Wait, I, oh, I can't. Wow, my laser pointer doesn't work on the screen. That's cool. Um, was uh, this link, ADR0014. And uh, you know, give me three letters and a couple numbers after it, I'm going to click it. So I did that, and it brought me to this page directly on GitHub. And my mind started to like, go all galaxy brain, like, what is this? Um, I noticed that there was a status, which implied that you could have different kinds of statuses to an ADR, um, that there was a decision, and you could scroll down and see even more information on it. Um, and so this was a long decision with what the supported operating systems were with implementation steps and guidance. Now, at this point, all I knew was this doc, but I'm gonna click that ADR link up in the tree, walk up a directory and see what I can find. <coughs> and uh, we can see we've got a couple of other decisions listed here. 
okay, we've got the minimum supported Python version, that's cool. Something about why web scraping is bad, that's fine. But then 001, record architecture decisions. Okay, let's go there. Oh, so I can see they started doing this in uh, middle of 2019, and they're basically saying, hey, we're recording documentation decisions this way. And it had a link to, as described by Michael Nygaard, and then that brought me to this blog post. And now I was really intrigued because I saw it, it was written in 2011. And I was looking at this in 2021, a decade later. I don't think a single one of the blog posts I wrote for lullabot.com or other places in 2011 have any relevance today. Most things that have been written online from a decade ago, their greatest historical artifacts is, oh, remember when? But not as something that's actually actionable and useful to me to, today. And, uh, you know, Home Assistant, it's a huge open source project. Uh, I would say in terms of number of contributors, maybe even more than Drupal, like it's, you know, a lot of individuals work on it, but they not only didn't come up with their own bespoke solution, they referenced something outside of the home automation space and they referenced something outside of the open source space. Uh, and given the age of it, I thought, well, this, they must have done some work to realize that this was a good way to approach documentation for their project. And this all comes back to the idea of valuable documentation. And that blog post, Every ADR that's ever been written since that blog post is probably not as valuable as that blog post that got uh, you know, us at Lullabot and the Home Assistant community and folks at Amazon and others using architecture decision records. So I could say pause and you could all click through and read what they're about, but let's talk about what an ADR actually is. So uh, an ADR is just three things. This is all you need. You need to have context why you needed to make a decision. You need to actually say what you're deciding as clearly as possible, and then you need to figure out what the consequences of that decision are likely to be, both good and bad. And that's really important because uh, sometimes you make decisions that intentionally privilege one group of users, one group of employees, one technical paradigm over another, and you gotta say that out loud, otherwise, uh, people are going to feel like they're not being heard. But an architecture decision record is not a heuristic. It needs to be a decision, you know, A then B. It's not a decision tree, it's not a flow chart. Uh, you know, it's got to be something that you don't have to guess about. Because if you're making a decision that you have to guess about, then it's not really a decision. Also, an ADR is not temporary. You're not making a decision for the next three months. You're hopefully making a decision for the next few years. Um, again, if you make a, an ADR and your ADRs are constantly being deprecated as not being valuable you know, weeks or months in, then you're not making a decision. You're making a reflection on the state of your project. And that's always uh, temporary. But likewise, an ADR doesn't have to be forever. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are times when technology changes, when uh, your company changes, when your project changes, and you might need to change a decision, and that's, that's okay. You don't want to lock yourself into a bad decision that's not working for you. And likewise, an ADR should not be the only source of documentation. It's not where you should have project onboarding docs, or setup docs, or here's how you run this site on your local, or do a deployment. It's about decisions and decisions only. As well, you shouldn't necessarily use them to document tasks or in-depth examples. You might generate tasks from an ADR, but it's not like a ticket. So uh, perhaps ADRs are the uh, can opener that's going to unstick our documentation efforts at Lullabot going back to 2021. And so we wondered how we would get started with ADRs, and we came up with this idea of invisible standards. And these were things that our team was already standardized on, but we had never really said it aloud or written it down. And this was so painful for new hires because they would come into a project, they'd be assigned a ticket, they would do some work, and then they'd immediately get a request changes feedback on it because they did have the unspoken context of uh, you know, what we were expecting. So here is our first ADR for using Environment Indicator. Uh, everyone, anyone here not familiar with Environment Indicator? 
All right. Okay, thank you for putting up your hand. So it's a really sweet module that tells you if you're on production or a staging environment or you're local so that if you're making changes, you don't accidentally do it in production. And uh, we realized this was a project or a, a Drupal module that we used on all of our projects. You know, we just did it. Often though, when we were adding it, there was no ticket around it. It was the developer. It's like, oh, the site needs environment indicator and they go and add it. So then we started to look at how it should be implemented because we didn't, again, coming back to the idea around decisions, you shouldn't then be left with a question of how do you actually implement this ADR? And uh, there's these colors that go into the menu to tell you what environment you're on. Now, this is what we uh, ended up with. We actually discovered that some of our projects had opposite colors for pro production or the live environment and locals. You can imagine like what a bullet we dodged that we never had a major issue where a developer accidentally deleted the home page on production because they were trying to replicate some bug. Um, we also discovered that some of our sites have colors chosen that violated accessibility guidelines, which is not something that we uh, wanted to see. So we worked with our design team, we worked with our accessibility experts, and uh, we ended up with an example implementation. And what this meant was this was something that you didn't have to think about, right? Like, you start a project, you inherit a code base, you install environment indicator, you configure it like this, and you go on. Uh, it really, ADRs like this are a great way to kick off a project backlog. You already have 10 to 30 tickets that you can just start filing and know that you need to do. Um, this right now is just copy-paste code. But we do think that uh, recipes may actually be a better solution for this in the future, where you could just have a recipe that configures the module the way you want it to be done. So uh, this is our Lullabot architecture website. Uh, it's completely public. You can go to architecture.lullabot.com right now and see our library of decisions. We're uh, actually, we're past 37 now. I think we're at like 42 accepted ADRs. Um, and the majority of our engineering team has participated <coughs> in at least one ADR, which is something that I'm really glad to see because it's not just a lot of small group top-down decision making. We built it into a collaborative process where the idea is, is we want buy-in from the whole engineering team or as much as possible so that we don't have projects where people are just not following the decisions because they don't like it. Um, Here's another ADR that we have. Uh, if you're not familiar with the simple add more module, it's a install and forget module, and it basically improves the add another experience on content forms. And there's a Drupal core issue for improving that, but it's got a patch, and you don't have to patch your site if you do this. We've um, taken the thinking about alternatives in our ADRs. And so, and this is a new section that we added in between decision and consequences that we don't use all the time, but often. And we explain what would cause an ADR to become deprecated. So in this case, there's a Drupal core issue. If that gets fixed, the module's not needed, we can deprecate this and move on. Now, I know I said, okay, so our, the, our solution was not communication, it was documentation. But it turns out it was communication too. Um, we have to have a process around um, what we do to actually write and accept an ADR. And so nearly all of our ADRs start with Slack because someone asked a question about the work they are doing right now. Uh, how do I implement this feature? Uh, I have a choice to make between two Drupal modules. Um, should I turn on this optional setting in meta tags or not? Um, but we don't know when that happens that it's actually going to turn into an ADR. It could, but we just don't know. But once those conversations grow, either you get people responding them to them over more than just a day, or people start liberally using shift enter and writing big paragraphs of thoughts and ideas and code samples and so on, it becomes to us a clear indicator that there's a longer term value in the discussion. And so we uh, use a tool called Discourse, which is a web forum software, and it is much more well suited towards long term 
uh, complicated discussions than Slack is. It has a, an add-in to Slack, which lets us select messages in a channel or an entire thread and start a discuss post uh, or discourse post <coughs> with it. Um, and so when we do that, for example, uh, my colleague Andy Bloom was asking about telemetry options in Storybook. And this started as a conversation in Slack. But we knew that there were people who wouldn't have seen that message or maybe were out of the office who wanted to catch up on it. And so we were able to continue this discussion and also have a reference where uh, you know, if someone asks me today, hey, what's our policy on telemetry? I can point them to where the discussion started. Uh, Likewise, here's another uh, example from 2021 where I was basically, you know, shrugging my shoulders and wondering, like, NPM and Yarn, why do we have both in our systems? Why do we have them on different projects? What's the, the deal with them? In this case, it was because uh, one of the tools we were using at the time, Dependabot, didn't support Yarn for automated updates. I think it does now. We're using Renovate either way. Um, but we'll have these discussions, and these don't necessarily turn into ADRs. But they can. Yeah, please come on in. Um, here's an example of an actual task where we had a discussion, we come to a consensus, and we just need to actually write the documentation. And so in this case, what we do is we have GitHub issues, and we just say write the ADR, and you know we'll link to the Slack threads or the discuss posts um, for where they are, provide some rough outlines that hopefully anyone on the team who is feeling motivated can pick this up and write the ADR. So at Lullabot, we have a couple of additional constraints on the ADRs that we will accept. First off, we don't write ADRs for things that everyone is already doing. We don't want to duplicate all of the Drupal documentation or the PHP documentation or the React documentation. If it's a default, we only write the ADR if we are not following that default. Um, as well, we really want our ADRs to be able to be written as a single title. Um, you should be able to read that title, and if you are an expert in that area, then you should be able to understand what the decision is without having to read the decision. We also expect, but don't require, that decisions remain in effect for at least one year. Uh, and we also assume that all ADRs are a baseline for projects that we start or inherit. Um, if they're only applicable to half of our work or to certain verticals or use cases, then it's not really a decision uh, that we can rely on. We need something that we can standardize across all of our projects consistently. Um, as well, a Lullabot ADR is also a list of deciders. We keep track of everyone who is part, a participant in those conversations so that uh, if years down the line, we're trying to reconstruct some history. We have more people we can go to to try and figure out what the, the discussion was about. We write all of our ADRs in Markdown, and we store them in a GitHub repository, uh, mainly because this is the lowest overhead infrastructure-wise. Um, but it's also what our developers and engineers like to use. I don't think anyone truly enjoys writing long documentation or even short documentation in Confluence. And, we didn't really want to have to uh, keep another Drupal site up and running. As well, our ADRs are actually released under a Creative Commons license. And so uh, it's fairly broad in that we are really, it's just attribution only. So you are welcome to use and reference these ADRs in your projects. In fact, um, we feel like that these decisions are not like Lullabot's proprietary secret information on how we do projects better. We feel like these are like our, our stake in the ground for how projects should be done in the world of Drupal. And we're much happier if others in the Drupal community are following these. I'd love to be able to deprecate ADRs because it's like, hey, everyone already does this now. It was our thing, now it's everyone's. We don't need to worry about it. Um, but what about project-specific ADRs? You know, everything we have at architecture.lullabot.com is meant to apply to all of our projects. But you do inevitably have that 10 to 20% of a project where you need to keep track of project-specific decisions. So we actually have this uh, written down on the homepage of the uh, architecture website where we describe when you should write a project-specific ADR. Uh, first off, we think you should write one when you are writing significant custom code. 
if you are dedicating a developer or two or more to a single subsystem in your project for months, there's probably good reasons for that, and you probably want to be documenting your decisions. Uh, you know, uh, maybe your team uh, is doing some really bespoke API integrations, and you're writing it completely from scratch. You might want to have ADRs describing why you're not using JSON API or GraphQL or some other uh, existing system that's out there. Uh, as well. We say that you should write an ADR when you're writing glue code that makes two unrelated systems talk to each other. One of the reasons I think many of us in this room really appreciate using Drupal is it's pretty easy to build unique applications by making parts of Drupal work with each other that you wouldn't expect. Maybe you need to do some headless work and you still want to use Layout Builder and you need to expose that over JSON API. I would never go into a project thinking that you would have REST endpoints for layouts. It's just not something you would expect. So an ADR describing why you did that and what led to that architecture could be really helpful. Um, as well, we think it's important to write ADRs when you have a major architectural decision. Uh, this is where all the PMs in the room, uh, you know, keep your ears open for these because if your team is having to have after talks, or multiple after talks, or dedicated meetings where it's like hash out our architectural technical direction on some part of your project. That's you're making decisions, and if you're not making decisions, then you should probably just cancel those meetings. But uh, you know, when you are getting that down into an ADR, uh, is a really good way to prevent having to rehash those and say, hey, what did we decide again? Or why does this PR go in a different direction from what we decided? You have a, a URL, you have a reference, you can say, here's what we decided to do, let's keep going on it. Um, here's some examples of uh, project-specific ADRs. So we always start with the first you know, one. Every ADR project or repository I've ever looked at starts with a record architecture decisions decision. Just so if you're like me, wondering what this is all about, you have some breadcrumbs to figure it out. Um, a really good example is this first one around auditing pre-release Drupal modules. Uh, we had a client where they actually put into their contract that we could only use Drupal modules that had security coverage, um, unless we did a security audit ourselves. Personally, I, I love this. Like, like, I think this is, you know, the number of modules that we've been able to encourage maintainers to get stable releases out because of that contract. Um, you know, it's probably five or ten at least, where it was like, hey, we just need to tag. This thing hasn't changed in three years. It can get security coverage. Um, but that's not something many, if I, I can't think of any other clients who do this. It's not something a developer would expect. He would generally be looking and say, oh, well, there's 50,000 sites using this module. Even though it doesn't have security coverage, we think there's still a lot of community effort around it. So we documented how and why we need to do that security audit. Um, and if you look at these, uh, you know, this is from uh, a government platform we built. Uh, let's see, I'm going to say five. No, like basically every single one of these except the second last one has to do with security and access control. Uh, and I think for most government projects, this is a great place to start with on your ADRs because you often are working with external security organizations who might bring requirements to your project that you have to follow that uh, just are, and you just have to do it, but how are you going to know you need to follow those requirements? Um, here's another example of uh, where we have given certain roles the administer menus permission. Uh, in the corporate world, I think most editors in Drupal sites end up being given this permission so that they can fully manage the navigation in the menu system. You can break your site so hard if you mess up your menus. Drupal lets you create recursive menus. It lets you have menus of arbitrary depth. Um, it lets you put in external links where maybe your design system isn't expecting them. And so in most of our government projects, we don't actually allow this because the people who are doing the editing don't have the training or the expertise not to make those mistakes. And so in this case, we did have to give some editorial users those permissions because someone has to manage the URLs, and uh, in this case, you know, we said, hey, this is something we're going to give to publishers, you know, only those who have at least that level of access, um, 
And we also document as a consequence, we're not going to solve a lot of the edge cases around the menu system in Drupal. We're going to rely on training. Because we have only a small number of users who actually have this permission, we can treat this as a training problem and not a really thorny code problem. Now, if anyone wants to solve this in core, that would be wonderful. I would be, I would love to see uh, more work on that. But uh, it's often hard to, to do that from the agency perspective when you're trying to get sites launched and out the door. So. Um, in 2021, uh, I actually gave a very early version of this presentation to our local Drupal users group, and I had these as next steps. Uh, and I'm pretty glad to say, like, we've done them all, which is really neat. Um, you know, we now have discourse for heuristics and discussions that really are not about ADRs. Um, our ADRs weren't public at first, and now they are. And we've actually moved from documenting just those invisible standards I mentioned to choosing standards for high cost problems. Um, I think one of the most effective ADRs we ended up with, I think maybe it was late 2021 or 2022, was that we standardized on DDEV as the local environment for all of our projects. And uh, you know that has even been so successful that even on projects that we inherit that aren't using DDEV, our support team will eat the time to convert it to DDEV because it's so much more efficient. Uh, and we're using ADRs on client projects, which is great. Oh, yeah, go back a little. Oh, this is, where is the? Okay, so this site is uh, written in Gatsby, and there is a public theme that you can use to take ADRs and generate your own website. Uh, it's a base theme, I think, is what they call it in Gatsby, and you know, it works well enough. Um, but. We're actually working on rewriting that in 11T right now. Um, we tried use this as an opportunity to trial Gatsby, see how it worked, and the truth was it wasn't really a great fit for us or our projects, um, and our team's been using 11T more. Uh, notably, we used it, if you go to analytics.georgia.gov, that's an 11T site that takes a bunch of data about all of their agencies and uh, surfaces it in a public way, it's pretty neat. Um, you know, our unreleased version of this in 11D brings the build times down from like 40 seconds for 40 pages, like absolutely atrocious to one to two seconds. Um, but there's no concept of base themes. And so we will be releasing a starter kit in 11D if you would like to use this. But the really neat part about building a website this way is that you don't have to make changes to the content itself to change the underlying technology. Both of these systems just read Markdown and build HTML. And for, you know, in this case, it's, you know, we're talking dozens of pages, not hundreds of thousands of pages. We're not talking about structured content in the same way. Um, you know, it's a really good alternative tool as compared to something like Drupal, where really you do want to be working with thousands of nodes, lots of displays and views and so on. So uh, coming up to 2024, yeah, I mentioned we have 42 accepted ADRs. We've only deprecated two of them. One of them was because uh, we actually split it up into several different ADRs. And then another one uh, was almost a mistake. Like it was like we had done some research and then discovered two months later that some of that underlying research just wasn't correct. And so we had to pivot pretty quickly. Um, we actually have referenced ADRs in our sales proposals and in upstream Drupal issues. Uh, and that's actually something that I didn't, I mean, the Drupal issues I kind of expected, but sales proposals I didn't expect at all. And I think that's a really neat aspect to having this sort of decision making in public because it gives you something to support the, the quality of decision making on your project. And there's been considerations of using ADRs in the broader Drupal community, um, such as in the Experience Builder module. Uh, I think schema.org blueprints has some decisions or was at least discussing it. Uh, and you know, there's really nothing that stops you from just sticking some markdown files into any project you have and uh, working on them. But I do think there's some areas I still want to see us improve on at Lullaby. Uh, you know, we have 42 ADRs and that's great. And we had a huge burst of activity when we started writing ADRs, but now we've kind of slowed back down. We're accepting a new one, I'm gonna say once every two to three months. Um, what this means is like any good project we have a large backlog of unreviewed ADR ideas. I think we have 30 or 40 of them right now. And, uh, you know, that's a sign of success, but it's also, you know, 
not necessarily motivating as an individual contributor when you come up with an idea, place it in the, the issue queue or in a discuss post, and it just kind of sits there without any further thought. Um, so, you know, I do think if you uh, bring a process like this into your organization, having someone who has the time and the resources to be able to go through and do that sort of gardening is really important. As well, I think more of our decisions than not are focused on back-end Drupal development and DevOps. We do have some good front-end ones. Um, one that's, I'll, I'll give you a sneak peek that's not released yet, is around always using relative units for font sizes uh, in CSS. Uh, and uh, you know that's a great example of a good front-end decision. But my own, you know, I said it to me, my own background is in PHP development, backend server development, and I do wonder how much of this slant in our ADRs is due to my own background, and how much of it is due to the fact that it's really hard, maybe, to standardize build processes and tooling on the front end because designs can just be so different. So, if I had any advice, um, I would say just start writing. The truth of the matter is, is that writing something down can in itself be a great way to have those conversations. They can get people raising their hands and saying, but you are totally wrong. And uh, they may have been thinking that the whole time, but you just, you didn't know it until you started writing a decision. Uh, and the truth is, compared to you know, software engineering, documentation is cheap. Uh, and so it's pretty you know, easy to do this work and not necessarily have to do a lot of rework. I would also highly recommend that you just use Markdown and Git because it requires absolutely no new tooling. It also means that you can bind the decisions you're making to given releases of your project. So if you want to know what the decisions were uh, a year ago, it's, even though you have dates and so on uh, in different ADRs, sometimes it's just easier to go back and see when that was created. Uh, and again, your developers are going to thank you for just using the tools that they already use. Um, and then once you get to this point, it is kind of okay to take your time. Um, the truth is, is like making a bad decision can really mess up a project or mess up your engineering team. It's okay to say we're going to let this sit for two weeks or four weeks, and if no one has anything to say, then we're going to write the ADR and do it. Because uh, it gives people a chance to maybe try the decision out on projects without it having been formalized across your team. It gives those folks who were on vacation or really busy on a project or what have you a chance to participate. And it gives people who are on your team that they know that there was a chance for them to participate and that if they choose not to, then that's okay, but then they also have to be uh, flexible around the decisions that are being made. So with that, I'm going to wrap this up with this home-related ADR. Um, I don't know how session uh, reviews or feedback are working. I didn't see anything in the slides around it. So if there is anything, I would really appreciate it. And otherwise, um, I'm glad to take questions now. And I'm obviously glad to take questions anytime throughout the conference. Just come up and find me. So uh, thank you for attending, everyone. I appreciate it. Do we have any? Yes. Um, for some of your ADRs, do you uh, have sort of built-in um, tests that can just roll along with them that you can deploy with your ADRs? Right. So the question was, do we have any sort of automated tests with our ADRs that could roll along with them? Um, our ADRs don't typically have a ton of code in them. So no is the answer to your question. Do we do that? Um, I would say we probably focus our tests less on the ADRs and more on the actual underlying modules. Um, okay, yeah. It's an interesting, we, we use Playwright for uh, most of our automated testing and we typically focus on editorial and end user tests. But if I go back to that example of environment indicator, like I suppose we could write a Playwright test around that. Oh, I'm going I'm to chew on it. That's a great, great idea. Thank you. Yes, it's specifically nice. talking about project specific ADRs, like I, I guess I'm, this is more of like a conversation piece, but like you had some suggestions for when you should use project specific, specific, specific ADR and things like that. But I guess like I'm trying to think of exactly where do you draw that line, and obviously there's like you can document everything, yeah. but the, 
is that really valuable and where does that play in? So like, do you have any suggestions or examples of things like, you know, something that comes to my mind is like, okay, we're solving a problem, we're choosing to use this module, that would be a good reason for an ADR, right? But how do you kind of differentiate that? Yeah, so actually uh, it is written down on the, the homepage for the website, but I didn't say it aloud, so I should, oh sorry, I should first, the question was how do we know when to create effective project specific ADRs? And I would first off say anytime a customer makes you contradict an ADR that we already have at Lullaby. Um, we have had some customers where they've said, hey, we know DDEV is great, but we really want to stick with Lando. So we'll write an ADR saying, here's the reason why we are using Lando, even though this is not Lullabot's preferred tool. Um, as far as your question around like selecting modules, I think anytime there's like not clear choices, right? Like you have two equally good but different solutions, writing an ADR is not a bad idea. But as you saw for that project, we didn't have a lot of those. Um, I would say most of our project specific ADRs, they have less than 10 um, because we want to be really focused on the decisions that matter because something like choosing a module, um, the truth is you're probably just going to be able to find out easily enough in a ticket or you're uh, going to look at the code and be like, well, obviously this is why we chose it because of how we're implementing it. Okay. Yeah, Brian. What's, uh, what's been the client reception to your ADRs and have any clients participate? Like, do you invite clients to participate in the ADR process? Yeah, so uh, Brian asked if we, like, what clients think about ADRs and if any have participated in the ADR process. Um, I would say that it depends how technical their teams are. For the teams who don't, for the clients we work with who don't have any engineers on staff, they're really not, not into the ADR process so much. I mean, it's all there, it's visible to them, but they're not necessarily participating. I would say for more of our blended teams where there are developers um, with the client that we're working with, um, in my experience, they've been pretty open to it and they, um, usually immediately recognize the issue of having the same conversations over and over again and are just glad to have something which is not another ongoing meeting to record those decisions and continue on with. So yeah, so far I don't think I've had any um, you know, real issues from the client side with this. Yes? Uh, I can add to that because um, I also work at Lullaby and frequently the developers on the teams really like this because if they think it's a good idea, then they can point to this other thing that makes it not just their idea, and it's very easy for them to then say, yes, we really need to do this. I've been advocating this for years, and here's my proof. Well, Bob does it, you know, or whatever it is. So, here's yeah. another question, yeah. Um, are all your project repos are most of your project repos public? Is that how you're able to sort of share those out, or do you have a way to, to sort of capture things that end up in the project repos but you want to share? Yeah, so our the project repos are not public. Um, we do have a process where we ask our clients for permission to create mirrors of the projects we work on within the Lullabot organization, and we use that to be able to go through and audit and see like, hey, what are the ADRs that have been accepted on these individual projects? And every once in a while, it's like, oh, these last three projects all have this project-specific ADR. Let's pull that up to the organization. Or sometimes you find they contradict, and that's a great way to have another conversation. Uh, in the pink shirt? How do you capture exceptions? How do you capture exceptions? Yes. Um, do you mean that in terms of like decisions where you are not following the decision? Yes. Yeah, so we do that by writing an ADR in the project that says, hey, um, you know, uh, Lullabot says you shouldn't use the config split module on sites, but the, the site already uses it and it's going to be too much engineering work to re-architect it, so that's the way it is. Or sometimes, you know, the customer has made that decision already for one reason or another. Um, you know, we think that Documenting exceptions is best done using the same format that the, the base documentation is written in. Uh, all the way in the back in the hat. Uh, how do you disseminate ADR, organization level ADRs to the team? RSS. 
Uh, so we actually have an RSS feed of the uh, uh, ADR website, and that goes into our engineering channel in Slack anytime something gets published. Um, you know, we also like people will leave posts and they'll say, "Hey, we're we're close to accepting this, or we need some we need to consult with." our design team on this ADR before we accept it. And so there is a lot of communication around it. Um, you know, and often for, for big ones, we might even make an announcement if it's like, so, you know, there are a couple of ADRs that we have which definitely don't ref didn't reflect common practice at Lullabot, but were clearly the decisions that needed to be made. And so in that case, you know, we might raise it up to our PMs and say like, hey, tr start trying to figure out how and if you can implement this into your project. You, you know, if that's even possible. Yes? Are you working on your 11-day build in the open? No, it's not. So we are, our actual ADR repository is private because we want to be able to talk specifically about projects and clients. Um, and you can imagine a lot of those conversations go along the lines of like, we chose this on this project and it was a really bad idea. <laughs> and we don't want to have to like put those clients in that public facing way. Um, you know, if you're suggesting that you are interested in contributing to that, um, I can uh, remind our folks that maybe uh, getting that public side of that starter kit up and running would be uh, a good thing to do. I was going to rebuild it in 11 in the new year. Oh, <laughs> I was, awesome. I was curious to see that, that that was a decision made. Okay, yeah, let's uh, connect after and I'll make sure to send you something when it's up. Yes? Maybe irrelevant, but I'm trying to implement these and just sometimes struggle with it. Do you always do a PR specifically for the just for the ADR, or do you kind of group it in with the implementation that it's part of? Yeah, I mean, we always do a PR for the ADR. Um, we will also do PRs that do minor changes, like hey, Drush 12, change the syntax of this command. The decision is the same. You know, that's that. Um, I do think, I see we've got our next you know, next speaker at the back there. Are you, is that you? Yeah. Okay, I want to wrap this up then so that they get a chance to connect up and make sure things are good. But um, if there are more questions, we can talk out in the hall or uh, anywhere else in the hall track. So thank you. Thank you.